Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Thursday, March 21st, 2024 edition of Trading Places Live at EarningsBeats.com. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes or so as we prepare for yet another market open, this time the day after the Fed. Uh, we saw the Fed come out yesterday, pretty much hold everything steady, uh, nothing crazy in terms of language, uh, sticking with three rate cuts later this year. And uh, so I think that's really what the stock market wanted to hear is that there was no change in plans based on uh, the hiccup that we had in the uh, March or excuse me, the February CPI, core CPI, and then, of course, the February core uh, PPI. And uh, I think that market got exactly what it wanted, um, that the Fed really didn't seem to be phased by uh, the slight uptick in inflation last month. Uh, instead, focusing more on the fact that the annual rate of inflation continues to drop. And historically, that's always been a good thing for stocks. So I think we're set up here uh, to move higher. Futures, uh, a little, at least a little bit ago, we're up right now. I can tell you what, the, what they are. Um, we've got with about 30 minutes to go now before the opening bell, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the Diamonds, which is the ETF that tracks the Dow. Uh, up about a um, little more than one third of 1%. The Spider, which is up about one half of 1%. The uh, QQQ, which tracks the NASDAQ 100, uh, up another 1% after gaining more than 1% yesterday. Back up near all time high territory on the QQQ, 448.14, up another $4. Uh, and 37 cents this morning. Yesterday, we we uh, finished up $5.20. That's almost $10 on the QQQ just over the past, well, really since about two o'clock yesterday, because things were pretty flat. So it's been a, a really nice rally in equities since the Fed uh, announced. Small caps, IWM, uh, up about a quarter of 1%. So certainly lagging the others, but uh, also having a great day yesterday, rising about 2%. Uh, which was four dollars moved back up above two oh six, and uh, so today right now two oh six sixty. So pretty good action across the board since uh, the Fed announced, and we'll talk a little bit more about the impacts that that uh, Fed announcement has had as we go through the session today. But uh, let's go ahead and uh, move into the recap for Wednesday, so we can take a look at exactly what happened. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gaining four hundred and one points. Finishing at 39,005, 12, 13, all time high. SP 500 jumping 46 points, clearing 5,200 on the close for the first time ever. Uh, finished at 52.24. NASDAQ 100 NDX rising 1.15%, 207 points to 18,240. Not quite up to that uh, new all time high, but certainly getting close. Mid caps, big day again, up another 1.36%. That was about 40 points, closing up close to that 3,000 level, which we have not closed above. The IWM Russell 2000 index, uh, that was up uh, almost 2%, as I mentioned earlier, 1.98%, $4. And really nice move to the upside. Volume really picked up as well in the afternoon after the announcement came out. You don't really see it on here because volume was very light during the first four and a half hours of the session. Final two hours, though, we saw the volume surge and uh, finish on the highs or close to the highs. So uh, good action there. Talk about this one a little bit more in a couple minutes, but transports, big push to the upside. That came after a reversing candle at support at 15.4 that I talked about yesterday. We had a piercing candle. It wasn't quite bullish engulfing, but it was pretty close. Uh, but that occurred right at price support. And then right on cue, we saw 1.8% jump in the transportation group. Three of the transportation areas, airlines, trucking, railroads, all three of those were in the top four industry groups in the transport or in the um, in industrials. So really good day. <clears throat> nice bounce off of key support. I think that's a big takeaway from yesterday's action. Uh, moving on to the sectors, discretionary leads to the upside. First of all, all five aggressive sectors were in the top five spots. So this wasn't some kind of 
gag or, you know, maybe just a little short term, little pop to the upside. This was supported the way we like to see rallies supported. The discretionary group rising 1.49%, industrials 1.2%, financials 1.19%. I don't have the percentages on the other two, but communication services was fourth, technology was fifth. That's what we want to see, those kinds of groups leading. The fact that industrials and financials outperformed communication services and technology suggests that maybe these two are going to be a little bit more the leaders for longer in 2024, which would be an awesome thing. I mean, look at their charts. Both industrials and financials just are not letting up. It looks like technology last year um, or earlier this year. It was just a straight move up, that AD line going right up with it, showing me that there's plenty of signs of accumulation out there to uh, also um, coincide with the strength that you see on the chart. So all good news. Moving on to the industry, or excuse me, into the in industry groups. Aluminum, top group yesterday, rising 5.66%. This has been very, very volatile, up, down, up, down. But over, over the past few weeks, you can see that the aluminum group has moved back up above its 20, 20-day 20 moving average. Um, it's been holding it. It bounced off of it again yesterday. And the 20 has now moved back up above the 50 and the PPO is positive. So all of that combined suggests that we now have an uptrend in play. Until the market tells us otherwise, aluminum looks like it's in a nice uptrend. Uh, AD line also following suit, by the way. Uh, mortgage finance, strengthening PPO, another price breakout. Mortgage finance, think about that. Why would mortgage finance be rolling like this? Well, it believes interest rates, number one, are going to come down. And I think, in essence, that's basically what the Fed told us. Eventually, it's happening. They didn't push it back. They still talked about the same number of cuts. Mortgage finance group loved that news. And you can see uh, the big move up gaining 4.65%. Recreational services, not going to go out and pay for recreational services. I mean, think cruise lines. That's basically a part of this group. Um, you're not going to see um, those types of stocks do well in an environment that's going to be poor. So for those thinking that we've still got some kind of recession ahead, stock market completely disagrees with you. The folks on Wall Street completely disagree with you. Money is rotating into areas that would benefit from a strengthening economy, not from a weakening economy. Moving on to the 10-year Treasury yield. You know, we still got that 435 high. We still got this potential handle in this uh, um, uh, cup. Let's get a quick update. So if you're <clears throat> keeping track of patterns, you've got an uptrend that started at the beginning of February. It's up to the 435 level, breaking above 420 resistance. And then from 435, went all the way back down just below the 50, down to about 404, turned right back around, went back up to 435. Looks like a pretty symmetrical cup to me. And now we've got a handle. So those who think we have higher interest rates coming, you know, based on this chart, you don't have to give up on that thought process just yet. Um, I don't believe you'd have to give up on that until we go back down below 404, because that would not only kill the handle. The handle normally can go back as much as maybe 50% of the cup. You don't really want it to drop more than that. So that would be down to about 420. And right now we're sitting at 425. So everything's still fine with this pattern. If it breaks below the 420 and it no longer looks like a cup and handle, you could still have sideways consolidation off of an uptrend. Uh, it would just be that the cup with handle pattern be broken. So 404 to me is now the new low that we need to watch. 435 is the high. Let's see where 10-year treasury yield goes. If it does break back out to the upside, one thing I will say is that the strength in the financials and the industrials would likely continue. I think this is where you would see leadership. Normally, when you get interest rates moving up, and you start ignoring the threat of inflation, moving up in interest rates signals potentially a stronger economy down the road. And so a stronger economy down the road would potentially favor, especially when you got short-term rates dropping, uh, that would be a very, very strong signal for financials and for industrials. So that's 
the signal I get on the upside if, if rates break out. If they break back down, we'll see what happens with financials, industrials. I'm not sure they go down. Maybe they just kind of go along for the ride with the market. But I think lower interest rates would begin to favor some of those other aggressive areas of the market. So for me, it's not whether the stock market goes up. For me, it's which groups lead. Um, and that's what I'm going to continue to focus on. After two o'clock yesterday, there was no question what was leading. We saw growth leading. We saw um, we saw aggressive leading, but we also had some pretty good areas in the defense and value oriented areas that also performed pretty well. So anyway, that's where we are right now on the 10 year treasury yield. Moving on to the S&P 500, there's your next breakout. Negative divergence still in play, but that PPO is starting to turn up. If we continue higher here over the next couple of weeks, as we start to prepare for Q1 earnings reports coming out, that PPO could move back up and start taking out some of these recent highs. I don't need it to go back here and take out the high back in December in terms of the PPO. All I want to see it do is just start to take out these highs from just the last few weeks. Because, the peop I mean, for me, looking at the negative divergence, I really only want to go back probably about five weeks, maybe a little bit longer, but five weeks. That would take us back right into here, maybe mid-February. So certainly if we get back, back past 1.5, I think the negative divergence would be eliminated. I mean, as we move higher, we continue to trade above that 20-day moving average. Hard to get bearish without breaking down below the 20-day. When you're trending above the 20 and the 20 is trending above the 50 and your PPO is in positive territory and your AD line is breaking out again, all those things suggest to me that the market is strong. So if you have one signal that's slightly cautious, I think the others completely outweigh it, especially just the price volume. Nothing more important in the market than price volume. And we just broke out the all-time highs. So kind of hard to be bearish at this point. And even for me, I've been talking about being a little cautious in the near term. Even some of those signals starting to fade away. Uh, NASDAQ 100, nice day yesterday. Still got a little bit of work to do to get back through the highs that we saw back at the beginning of March. But nonetheless, after falling below the 20-day, we came rallying right back, which has been the history, at least the recent history of this index. When we do have a period of weakness and we've moved below the 20, it hasn't lasted. We've not gone to the 50. So just like the recent lows, we had one day below the 20 day moving average and now we've closed three consecutive days back above it, threatening another breakout, hard to get bearish. IWM, this one, instead of breaking down out of the channel that I've talked about, if you connect the highs, this high back on January 8th and then the high on, what was that, um, February, 15th right there. And then the one, the most recent high on the IWM, if you connect those highs and you drag that line, it connects perfectly with these lows coming across. So we have a beautiful channel in play right now. I was questioning the IWM. Do we hold that? Do we hold that channel and maybe even the 50 day moving average to the downside? Do we break that first or do we break out above that 20 day moving average? where the IWM had closed beneath it four days in a row. We got our answer yesterday and we saw the volume really escalate in the small cap area. Big breakout. Now we have our sights on the 20 day to the downside and probably up around the 209 level to get a close. I'll tell you that exact number. The open on March 8th was 208.74. So we need another one, one and a quarter percent on the IWM on a closing basis to clear and break out again. That would be a bullish development because remember IWM, if we look out to a weekly chart, we kept struggling right around that 197, 198 area. We had a couple highs up here around 205, I think, 205, 206, which is about where we are. But we went up to 210 and we continue to trend above this rising 20 week moving average. The PPO continues to move higher. I'm seeing on a from a long-term perspective, we're seeing the, the momentum accelerate on small caps to the upside, and we have been successfully holding that rising 20-week moving average. 
If you can't see the difference between that action this year versus the action over the last year prior, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I see completely different tactical picture here on the IWM. So what I'm looking for is for this trend in the long term to continue to hold and eventually go up here and challenge this 235 area, which is the high that we saw in November 2021. All right, transports, as I mentioned, there is the, get it just a little bigger there, but that was the piercing candle right there that we were talking about yesterday. Nice reversal, and it came right at 15.4 which is where the last two lows were. Off of that, with the Fed announcement yesterday, we saw transports exploding to the upside. And if we go to a five-day, 10-minute chart, look at what happened after two o'clock. Check out the IWM after two o'clock. So we weren't doing anything leading up to the Fed announcement. This is Wall Street, this is where Wall Street was putting its money, the big Wall Street firms, after that Fed announcement. Now, you can argue with it if you want. I tried not to. I try to listen to the story that charts are telling me because that's what's really happening. Uh, I'm not quite sure when you listen to what's happened, what they talk about on CNBC. Sometimes I think it's fantasy land. Um, but anyway, charts don't lie. IWM, you can see the QQQ after two o'clock, boom. Uh, spider. Same thing. Um, you want to look at some sectors. XLK, boom, last two hours. XLY, finishing right on the high. XLC, another big move there. XLF, up. XLI, up. Those are your five aggressive groups, and they all responded bullishly in the last two hours yesterday. That's important. We got new news, latest news. So, Using that information and then following where the money's going is very important. Anyway, everything looks good. How about the defensive groups? XLP, after two o'clock, I mean, we finished near the high. XLU, eh, we were right here, kind of finished almost on a par with uh, uh, where we were prior. Um, XLRE, real estate, moving up. Um, XL. V, healthcare, moving up. XLE, moving up. XLB, moving up. Where was the weakness? Nowhere. Relative weakness in defensive areas. But doesn't this look like wide participation? After the announcement, utilities flat, everything else up, everything. I mean, fight it if you want. I see the market continuing to go higher. Again, we're going to have short-term pullbacks at some point. We haven't really had much of late. We will have those. We'll go through periods that'll test our, you know, test the stomach. But overall, in my opinion, this market wants higher prices, and I think we're going to get them. Earnings Beats. Go over to my home at earningsbeats.com. You can sign up for a free 30-day trial. Just hit that green start your no cost trial button right there. We still have this free download available. Can't make it any clearer. It's right here on our homepage. Absolutely free. Click download the report. Like I've said before, this was probably the most eye opening information that I ever learned in the stock market when I started putting these historical numbers together. History, you know does repeat itself a lot in the stock market and understanding the trends, historical trends, I think is extremely important, much more so for a trader. I mean, if you're trading stocks and you don't know the history of the market and when stocks go up, when they tend to go down, if you don't, I mean, that's a massive indicator. It doesn't guarantee us it's going to happen every year that the same trends are going to hold true all the time, but it's giving us tendencies please download this. I'm giving it away. Also, if you want to learn more about Earnings Beats, name, email address, you can subscribe to our uh, free Earnings Beats Digest newsletter. This no credit card required. Just hit that subscribe button after filling out this, the name and email, and uh, we'll start shooting you, 
shooting you our free newsletter comes out Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So today, what I wanted to, to go over is the chart of the day. And this was something I believe I featured in yesterday's trading room. I don't think I featured it on the show. If I did, just forgive me, I'm getting old. But on this chart, actually, let me make this a little bit bigger down here. All right, so on this chart, here is, it's one month, a last month of activity. You've got the 10-year treasury yield falling for about half the period and then rising for the other half. What's the big deal? Well, if you notice, when the 10-year treasury yield has been falling, IWM has been rising. And then when the 10-year treasury yield was rising, the IWM was falling. So a pretty simple conclusion that I could draw heading into the Fed yesterday, the Fed meeting, was that if we saw rates move lower, that was an indication that we were likely to see prices on the IWM move higher. And that's exactly what we saw. Saw so move down late in the day, um, finished down for the day. Initially, we had a huge move down. Then we went up 432, came back down, finished down near the low of the day. Gap down lower today, started to move up. Now it looks like maybe it's starting to roll back over again, but the lower um, yields are sending prices again higher in pre market action. Um, and if you came in late, I'll give you the latest pre market. We're opening in about eight minutes. Diamonds right now, just where they were, up a little more than one third of 1%. Spider also about where it was, right near one half of 1%. QQQ up just over 1%, so it's just a tad higher than where it was earlier. And then the IWM, which was trailing the three, has actually started to pick back up again. It's now four-tenths of 1%. Um, it's a 206.90. So I think that number we were looking at was closer to 209, 208, what was it, 208.74. So based on where we are right now in pre-market, the IWM needs 1% more on a closing basis to set a new um, high in this move to the upside. So that's where we are, but this has been kind of an interesting chart. And I say, I say it's interesting because what we normally see in the stock market is rates normally go up because the economy is strengthening. So normally what we see are rates move to the upside, not flying to the upside, but normally you know moving higher. And that results from money coming out of treasuries. So the price of treasuries, um, well, yeah, the price of treasuries and the yield move inversely to one another all the time, always 100% inverse. So if folks are selling treasuries, treasury prices going down, yields go up. That's just the way it works. Normally what happens in a strengthening economy or in an economy where we're, we're expecting it to strengthen is folks will leave the bond market because returns in the stock market tend to go much higher when our economy is strengthening. Profits go up, sales go up, profits go up, multiples go up. And so even though rates start to move up a little bit, your the ability to make more money is in the stock market. And so that's the normal relationship. Yields go up, stocks go up. What's happening here? It's the exact opposite. Well, my theory is that the 10-year treasury yield right now is reacting more to inflation than it is to economic activity. I think folks are worried about inflation. Some are, some aren't as much like me, um, but you got, do have a lot of folks out there that are um, wanting higher um, yields in order to take on that risk of higher inflation. I mean, it, you don't want yields dropping to 3% if inflation is gonna go back up to 6%. You're losing 3%. Your, on your money. So you always want a yield that's going to be at least up close to or even higher potentially than inflation. Anyway, that hasn't been the case. So I think what's happening is that we've been reacting more to inflation. And as we get further and further along and the annual rate of inflation continues to drop and the Fed starts cutting rates, I think we will see this normalize. I think that Rates will probably drop back somewhere, I'm guessing, maybe to three and a half. I mean, we could go to three, but I'm going to say three and a half. 
I just think we're in a new normal. We're not going back down to 0.4. I'd be shocked. But I think we'll probably be more in like the three and a half to four and a half range for the foreseeable future. And as a result, I think that will be, I mean, that that rate of interest, I mean, three and a half, four and a half percent historically, that's still pretty cheap money, which is going to allow a lot of companies to borrow at lower um, with lower rates uh, to grow their business. I think that's going to be very helpful to these smaller companies. So I do think we're going to settle down on rates. And I think that's going to lead to higher prices overall in the market as we go forward. Now, if you say, well, what, you know, you just said they're going to go hand in hand, 10 year treasury yield is going to go up. Stocks are going to go up. Now you're saying yields are going to come down and then prices are going to go higher. So which is it? Well, if you look at a long-term chart and let's, let's look at a monthly, uh, monthly 50 year chart. Now forget about the IWM down here. Just think about what the stock market has done since the 1980s. It's gone up, right? Yields have kept coming going down. So it's like they're, they're going opposite. So why do I think that there's positive correlation? Well, if you look at the big rallies in the past, if you go back and you look, a lot of times when you have these moves to the upside, like look at 1998, 1999, yields were flying to the upside and we had one of the best stock markets in history. So what happens is, when yields are coming down, the market just kind of meanders sometimes. And, you know, you, you kind of get, I don't want to say inverse relationship, but you get maybe the appearance sometimes of inverse. But many times when we had yields going up, I mean, yields bottomed in 2003, went up to 2006. That's when we had a cyclical bull market. Remember? 2001 to two, or 2000, 2010, the bear markets were at the beginning and the end of that decade. In the middle, we had the market going up with rates going up. Remember, I mean, when we saw rates start to go up in 2022, people were were, uh, were telling me you can't fight the Fed. And I'm like, why can't you fight the Fed? You hear that on CNBC? Because that's what they like to talk about. Go away in May. Don't fight the Fed. Back in 2003, actually it was 2004 to 2006, there were 17 consecutive rate hikes, 17 consecutive rate hikes. What'd the market do? It went up. Thought you couldn't fight the Fed. What was it, 2022? I think it was in May of 2022 that we had our first 50 basis point hike. And I remember everybody saying, can't fight the Fed. We're going to go down. Can't fight the Fed. Been saying it for decades. Can't fight the Fed right? Can't fight the Fed. Well, I called market bottom in June of 2022. The market had already priced in the rate hikes that were coming. The market doesn't wait. Market looks ahead. So anyway, just a little bit more information there. But on this move to the upside, we have seen stocks from that 2022 low, even the IWM. But if I pulled up, let's pull up the QQQ. I mean, those are large cap growth names. Surely they're not going to go up with rates going up, right? That lowers valuations, higher interest rates, those two. So let's see what QQQ did. We know what it did. Just getting my point across here. Can't fight the Fed? Well, it looks like we're, we fought it and we won. 20, 2004 to 2006, we fought the Fed and we won. Stop listening to CNBC. Stop listening to all the crap that they spew on there. They have no interest whatsoever in your financial goals. They're trying to sell ads. They want everybody watching. They want everybody to watch the train wreck. They want to talk about the train wreck before it happens, even if it's never going to happen. Why? More viewers, more people to panic. Anyway. All right. That's it. Uh, I do want to go over one more um, stock. Let's go with the uh, MU. It is 9.30, big earnings report. Oh, ready for this one? MU was expected to have a loss of 27 cents in their latest quarter. They posted a profit of 42 cents. That's a 69 cent difference. So as you might imagine, Micron had a nice little gap up. That's certainly not going to hurt the semis. 
I know one of our stocks in our trading room yesterday, Western Digital was one that I took a position in. And a lot of these stocks are being lifted. You know, and this, I, I said, you know, when you get down close to the 20 day moving or 50 day moving average, like here, as you go back and you look at all these, this is when you want to buy on these pullbacks. I mean, if you're getting in down here and you're close to the 50 day, you can keep your stops really tight and you got the potential of a 10% move to the upside. Well, there's 7% right here at the open. I can tell you right now, as soon as I get off of this show, I'm going to go in and take my profit because it didn't open above resistance. Maybe it'll break out, but literally bought it yesterday morning and I'm up close to 10% on it. This is what we try to do at Earnings Beats. We try to get in on these pullbacks and hopefully stocks do what Western Digital did. Now we got lucky. Hey, sometimes you get lucky in the market. Sometimes you don't, you're unlucky. So accept the times when you're lucky because it's not, you're not always going to be lucky. A lot of times you get very bad breaks in the market. But WDC definitely getting a lift because of Micron. Similar business, you know, they're all in it together. Um, I didn't look. Seagate, probably same thing. Um, is that SG? That doesn't look right. No. Seagate, what the heck is it? STX. How do I not know that? STX, a little bit of a lift, not as much, but up 3.4%. Anyway, quick up update on the market. Let's see where we are the day after the Fed. And we got the Dow up another 162. We got the S&P up 27. NASDAQ up less than 1%. Actually, the uh, uh, NASDAQ 100 up 1.02%. Small caps, mid caps up. Look at the VIX back down to 12.6. That's why a lot of folks, they see the VIX moving up 14. They think all oh, that's bad because the VIX is moving up. Did it turn out to be bad? It actually turned out to be just fine. And that's what happens. Typically, the market does well as long as the VIX remains below 20, especially 17. That's what kind of the number I look for. 17 to 20 starts getting dicey. If it goes over 20, be careful. That's when the biggest losses occur is when the VIX is over 20. Anyway, that's it for me. Have a great day. And I'll be back next Tuesday for your next Trading Places Live. Please hit the like button. And subscribe to our channel if you like what we do and the all of that we have to offer, um, the time we take to do these shows. Hit us up with the like button and uh, and also subscribe. That will help us with the YouTube algorithms, and we'd really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.